I wanna title this message, The First Sermon of Jesus. Jesus' first message. And if you're in Matthew chapter five, verse one, Jesus was on this mountaintop. Thousands of people had gathered to him. And he sees these crowds, and as they're seated, um, if you've ever seen the TV show, The Chosen, right? You see this, this large mountaintop with thousands of people gathered, and Matthew, the writer, is sitting there. He was a tax collector. I love that Jesus hung out with sinners like you and me, right? And he's got Matthew, and Matthew's probably not made all the best choices in his life, but he wants to follow Jesus, is there anyone in the room that just wants to follow Jesus? You may not have made all the most amazing choices, but you want to follow. That's the best choice you can make right there. No matter what regrets you came in here with, no matter what shame or guilt, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So Matthew's sitting down, and Jesus starts off the sermon. Thank you so much, Keys. I'll call you back in just a moment. I don't want to put people to sleep today. I need you to stay awake for the next 30 minutes. Jesus starts off the sermon with, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor. If you're a note taker, note takers are history makers. You could just write down that first, what we call the Beatitudes, the first blessings that Jesus would say. And by the word, uh, by the way, blessed here is meaning like Congratulations. Happy are the people who live like this. You, you've, you've stepped into the real kingdom life when you live this way. He says, congratulations. You, you must be happy, those of you who are poor in spirit. Now, if I was to ask the question in the room, who wants to be poor? Very few people would lift their hands up like, uh, I'm trying to make it, man. I'm trying to pay my bills. But Jesus wasn't talking about poor in the sense of finances, he was talking about poor in the sense of your spirit. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Then he continues. He says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. These are called the Beatitudes, the blessings. Jesus is talking to his church, the very first group that would follow him. And he says, you're blessed when you're weeping. You're blessed when you're mourning, you're blessed when you are weak, you're blessed when you are humble, you're blessed when you're broken, you're blessed when your spirit is crushed, you're blessed when you're hungry and thirsty. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Now, Jesus would go on to say a whole lot of other things, like when you get punched in the face, don't punch the guy back. We've seen this happen in our own church with my dad. He got punched in the face at an altar call. Jesus says, turn the other cheek. Jesus says, you've heard an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but I say pray for your enemies. Love your enemies. Love those who persecute you. Right? Jesus had this upside down kingdom. It was all about if you want to go high, you got to get low. If you want to be powerful, you got to be weak. If you want to be in charge, you got to be a servant. If you want to be blessed, you got to be the one that's blessing others. See, our world was all about our society in that time. The Roman Empire was teaching this kingdom of we take it physically, <laughs> violently. We, we flex our muscles. Even the Pharisees, they flex their spiritual, self righteous prideful acts like, I've tithed, I've attended church, I'm the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, but Jesus says, no, 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 the greatest is not the proudest. The greatest is not the most confident in their own deeds. The greatest is poor in spirit. The greatest is meek. And, and then he gets to the mercy part. And to understand this part, you gotta go to Matthew 7, which is part of the same sermon, and we're gonna work backwards, but I wanna go to Matthew 7, Verse one, Jesus says, do not judge or you too will be judged. Now, this is all part of his very first sermon. Jesus was hitting a home run with this message, but it was also stepping on a lot of people's toes. Jesus says, in the same way you judge, now he's connecting this with mercy. In the same way you show mercy, you're gonna receive mercy. In the same way you judge people, you're gonna be judged back. And with the measure you use, that same measure is gonna come back to you. And then he says, why do you look at the speck? I got a speck with me, it's a toothpick, but it's also a speck. He says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye? 
Pastor Ty, I need your help. I found the speck in Pastor Ty's eye. Oh, I found it. It's right there. You better, you better deal with your sin, brother. You better deal with that issue. Jesus says, why, why are you so focused on the speck and you pay no attention to the two by four that's sticking out of your eye socket, bro? And you're like, hey, this girl just came into church and she is a mess, man. This guy, he's messed up. These people, this family is broke. They're messed up. And Jesus says, you judge so many people in the church. Like you can't wait to, to throw your stone at the latest person who just fell morally. You can't wait to gossip about the latest girl that just did something she shouldn't have done. And Jesus says, you pay no attention. It's getting quiet in this charismatic church. You pay no attention to the plank problem. Maybe we should title this sermon, get the plank out of your life. Let's title that. Get, turn to the person next to you and say, get the plank out of your life. <laughs> Jesus says, how, how can you deal with this little thingy in her life, in his life, in your husband's life, in your wife's life, when you got this thing staring back at you? Because when you point one finger, you got four fingers pointing back at you. Well, maybe three. The thumb is somewhere. <laughs> the whole Sermon on the Mount was about dealing with your own plank, dealing with your own stuff, dealing with your own heart. Because in a society where so many of the Israelites were pointing fingers at people, throwing stones at the latest sinner, Jesus came to preach a very internal, personal sermon to every listener, moms, dads, sons, daughters, grandparents, Pharisees, Sadducees, tax collectors. Jesus said, hey, I know you think you got it all together, that you're better than the other sinners, but I came to preach a sermon that confronts everybody. Let's deal with the plank. So I'll take that because that's on me too. So with that, let's, let's go back to verse three. Blessed are the poor in spirit. What does this mean, and what does this have to do with your plank and my plank? <laughs> the poor in spirit are people who know they need God. He's not talking about poor people financially. He's talking about people that are realizing on the inside, I'm sick, and I need a great physician. Yeah. Jesus said, I didn't come for those who think they don't need a doctor. I came for those who need a doctor. Jesus said, I didn't come for those who are spiritually prideful about how awesome they are in church. I came for those who, who walked into church going, man, without the mercy of God, I am nothing. Like without his grace, without the cross, my righteousness is filthy rags. I, I, I did a couple of good things this week, but the, to be honest, man, I am a sinner in need of a savior. How many of y'all would say, that is me? I, I need the mercy and grace of God. Now, listen, I grew up in Word of Faith Church. That's victory right here. This is a faith church. But sometimes we can take that mindset and go, I'm the head and not the tail, Paul. I'm above and not beneath. I don't have any issues. And we fall into this ditch of thinking God wants us to faith our way away from humility and brokenness. God is more attracted to a broken humility than he is in a, a spiritually prideful arrogant, like I've got this all together. It's a, it's a very healthy, like we got to have this balance where we carry a spirit of faith, but that faith is, is cloaked in humility. The faith doesn't come from our good deeds. The faith comes from his good character. I don't have faith in myself. I don't have faith that I'm amazing. I have faith that God is good even when I'm not. <laughs> Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, Jesus tells a story to illustrate what this means in Luke 18. And again, this is his words. So if you get mad today, just email Jesus or tweet at Jesus or post a story about Jesus. It's his talks. It's, it's red talks. It's Jesus talking to us. But in Luke, he talks about two different people in verse nine. He says, to those who are confident of their own righteousness... To those who look down on sinners and everybody else, saying, Paul, I see your son. He's getting out of his seat right there. <laughs> you, you need to get your family together, buddy. 
And I see what's going on. And that girl, she walked in here with those spandex pants and that tattoos and, you know, like people just, people just get so judgmental. Jesus says, you know, to everyone who's looking down on, and I was, when we were praising worshiping, I saw some people and they were over there and they were making out during the middle of church service. They're not even worshiping. Well, what were you doing? I saw some sinners smoking a cigarette outside before they walked into church. Good, I'm glad, this, that I'm glad they came to church today. This is a church for anybody. And if it's not, then we're toast, y'all, because we all need Jesus. Well, I don't know, Paul. I don't know if we should let you know, people in here that got addictions and stuff. That, that's what the church is for, my friends. Let's not miss the point of gathering. We don't gather so that we all can look at how clean we are. We gather because we need him to purify us and make us more like him. <laughs> we need the grace of God. And Jesus says there were people and they were looking down and they didn't even realize it. They had planks in their own eyes. And Jesus says two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a tax collector. Notice he doesn't say one was a rich guy and one was a homeless man. Both of these guys had financial stability. Both of these guys probably had some issues in their life differently. The Pharisee didn't know it, but he had some spiritually prideful issues. The tax collector, he knew he had cheated people. He was a businessman. He knew he had made some money, probably unethically. And the Pharisee stands by himself. He's watching the Asbury revival go on. And he's like, these college kids repenting of sin. They're so messed up, addicted to pornography and stuff. Hey, you know, this, he's tweeting about it. He's judging every revival he sees. He's like, yeah, victory's got another revival. Well, I'm better than them, you know? And the Pharisee is like so cynical about any repentant person. He stands by himself. He says, God, I thank you that I am not like the adulterers in the room. I'm not like the thieves and the tax collectors and the robbers. I fast twice a week, Jesus. I give a tenth of all my money. And Jesus says, the tax collector, he stands at a distance. He's somewhere in the shadows. And he beats his chest. He says, God, I'm a mess, man. I'm trying my best, God, but I know I fall short as a dad, as a husband, as a, as a businessman. God, I need your mercy. I need your grace. God, I need your help. Lord, please forgive me. And then Jesus turns to the crowd. He says, I tell you that this broken man, poor in spirit, went home justified with God. Not because he was so educated about the latest revivals. Not because he had memorized all the scriptures in the Torah and all the worship songs. He went home justified with God because he was poor in spirit. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You want heaven to invade your marriage? Stop acting like a know-it-all. Stop acting like you are always right, stubbornly always the one that's right. You can be right and still be wrong. Because without humility, God is repulsed by our egotistical, stubborn, self-righteous pride. Amen. Matthew 5, verse 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn. What does he mean here? Jesus understands our tears because Jesus himself mourned more than once. We see in John 11, verse 35, that Jesus wept when he saw other people weeping over a brother who just died. When you are weeping, God is close to you. See, God is close to the brokenhearted. He comforts those who are mourning. So often we're afraid to show our tears, especially as men. We've been taught grown men don't cry. 
Research actually shows that women cry 50 to 64 times a year, while men only cry five to 17 times a year. I probably fall into the 17 plus times a year. I don't know, I'm just in touch with my emotions. But the reality is, research has shown whether it's happy tears, sad tears, angry tears, or regretful tears, the medical benefits of crying have been traced as far back as the classical era. Even in ancient Greece and Rome, they said that tears worked as a purgative, draining and purifying healing medicine for the soul. Today, psychologists have concurred that crying is a mechanism that allows us to release stress and emotional pain and actually heal sickness and disease in the heart. Did you know that when you mourn, when you weep, you're allowing healing to, to enter into your heart? But weeping and mourning is a humbling thing to do. And then there's a mourning that's connected to sin. When you feel heartbroken over sin that you've committed or sin that's been committed against you. And Jesus says in this, this kind of mourning, this is where real transformation happens. This is where real change begins to take place. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10 that God actually delights in sorrow. When we are sorrowful for our sin, it results in true salvation. And there's no regret that's connected to that kind of sorrow. Have you ever just felt sorrowful for something you did? Like, you, not just because you got caught, but because you just felt like, man, that was, that was so foolish. Three of us in the room. All right, I relate with you. The rest of y'all, like, you guys are killing it in life. But some of us have wept and felt it. And it's painful. And you're like, man, when is this gonna end? And God goes, this is good, man. This is actually really good. I know you wanna be happy. I know you wanna go to like Big Splash if it still exists and, and get like donuts and, and, and have a good time and have a birthday party or something. But there's something powerful about mourning. There's something really sweet that God's doing that only happens with tears. And those who sow in tears will reap a harvest of joy. Don't, don't repress the tears. Don't hold them back. There's something about releasing them that actually invites the healing ointment of God. Matthew 5, verse 5, Jesus says, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Now, again, we're, we're in a society where we want to flex our strength. We're like, hold up. I'm the greatest, you know? I was talking with Coach Dan Donahue, our principal of high school at Victory, and he said, I was watching on ESPN yesterday, and there was four of the top quarterbacks in college, and they were being interviewed about like their skills, and each one of them was like, I'm the most amazing quarterback you've ever seen. I'm incredible. I've done an incredible job. I'm great at this. I'm the greatest of all time. I'm the real GOAT, you know? And he was like, it was just repulsive how none of them thanked their mom and dad, none of them thanked their linemen, None of them said, I can't do it without my team. They were all so egotistical about themselves. And we think, yeah, 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 well, that's how you win, man. Like, you, you win. If we're learning anything right now in society, leaders who walk into an office as, as like the, the head, the CEO, and say, everybody listen to me. I know what I'm doing. I got all the answers. I got it all figured out. Just follow me, and I'll never you know, lead you wrong. Those leaders are, are not the leaders the world is looking to follow anymore. It's leaders that go, guys, I don't have it all figured out. But together, we can do this. And I need your help, Ashley. I need your help, Daniel. And I can't do it without Ty and Debbie. And this church would not, this church doesn't rest on the talents of one guy. This church is built on just incredible, faithful, stable people like Sharon Darty and Iru and Debbie and Ty. And, and Pat and, and, and Terry and Ashley and so many of you that are all around the room that pray. And God says, meekness is attractive. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is this humble spirit that goes, I don't know it all and I can't do it all. And I need help and I surrender. He says, those who are meek actually inherit the earth. Now, if you wanted to like take over more stuff, and, and people who are like, Paul, we should build another church campus in another city. 
and we should do this, and we should build another dream center, and we should, and I'm believing God for that. I'm believing God that we're gonna get Utica Park Clinic building over here, that we're gonna get 75 acres in North Tulsa, that we're gonna continue to expand, and the school's gonna grow, and the church is gonna grow. That's called inheriting the earth, right? God wants his children to inherit the earth. I truly believe that. God wants more businessmen and businesswomen to fund missions and to change the world. But can I tell you how it's not gonna happen? It's not gonna happen with this Napoleon Bonaparte mindset, like, let's conquer the world. Alexander the Great, take it by force. No, God says, you wanna inherit the earth? Get low. You want the dream center to grow? Get low. You want the church to grow? Get low. You want your business to grow? Get low. And you go, hold on, I thought I gotta get big. I thought I gotta flex my muscles. God says, no, 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 the meek inherit the earth. We're watching powerful men lose it all right now. Why? Because power is a seductive, demonic force that convinces men, the more power you have, the more in charge you are, the more you can inherit the earth, but the most powerful men like Lucifer fall pretty hard from Hollywood to churches. This is why we got to get low. Your only path forward is humility. Your only path forward is meekness. It's here. God says, that's, that's what I delight in. Just a broken, meek, poor spirit that says, God, I need you. Lord, I need you. I need your help. I need your strength. I want the band to come out. Jesus says this is where victory happens. It happens when you, your most powerful posture is not on your feet. It's on your knees. It's in a place of surrender. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. What are you hungry for? Our schedules really tell us what we're hungry for. How do I know what I'm thirsty for, what I'm hungry for? Just look at your schedule, look at your bank account, look at your latest statement. Where have you spent the most money, the most time? Where is your energy going? And, and Ashley and I, we got five kids, so we, we gotta spend a lot of time with our kids. But, but you know what, and we love that. We love spending time with our kids, they're amazing. I'm not just saying that because they're in the room. I'm saying that because I genuinely love Liam, Benny, Mac, Ellie, Gianna. But you know something I tell our kids is, guys, Jesus is first. Jesus is first. We make a priority to pray. We make a priority to lean into what does it look like to let God lead our house, to invite his presence with worship music and stuff. And we don't always get it right, man. There's times where we get into silly arguments. And then it's, it's at that moment where God goes, okay, who's gonna be the first to the cross? Husbands, one of the best ways we can lead the house is, is to be the first to apologize, to be the first to say, I was wrong. Because that, that's where victory is won. If we're gonna be peacemakers, which Jesus goes on to say, blessed are the peacemakers, then we gotta be strife stoppers. And strife stoppers are people who don't try to win an argument, but they're the first ones to go, hey, more than anything, I just want peace between you and me. I want peace in our house. I want peace in our family. I want peace with, with, with our sons, with our daughters. We're gonna bind the spirit of strife and arguing. And in a world that's so divisive, we need more peacemakers. We need less opinionated tweeters and opinionated Facebookers and opinionated, you know, just everybody's got an opinion and everybody wants to jump into the argument. Who's gonna be the first to the cross to say, hey, let's just, let's just let's let, let's let love win this situation. Let's let the love of God win. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they are the children of God. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. Again, I'm almost done, but God, I just pray this week you would diffuse arguments and strife in homes. That you would diffuse mean thoughts, mean words towards people that you would diffuse anger, retaliation, revenge, searching for specks in other people's eyes. God, that you would get the focus back on what you wanna do in us. Lead us to the cross. 
God, I pray, Lord, you would break our hearts for what breaks yours. Lord, I need you. God, I need your mercy. I need your grace. Lord, I need your help every single day. Lord, I want your righteousness inside of me. I can't can't make myself righteous. Only you can do that. So, Lord, I want you to fill me with your righteousness. With every head bowed, every eye closed, if you're here today and you just say, I need more of Jesus in my life, in my heart. I need more of his kingdom at work in my life. Would you just raise your hand if that's you all over this room? You're just going, I need I need to walk in that mercy, that humility, that that meek posture to say, God, I need you. Maybe you're tired. Maybe you're weary. Maybe you carried burdens into church today. Maybe you just feel hungry for God to move in your life. And God says, yes, 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 that's what I want. If you raised your hand or you wanted to raise your hand or you just want to come down to the altar, would you leave your seat? Come and join me at this altar right now. All over this room. And let's just take a moment. If you're here today and you say, man, I I need to get things right with God, come and join us. You can join us all over the room down at this altar to say, Lord, I surrender. God, I lay down my my rights. I lay down my agenda. I lay down my, my pride. I lay down my ego. God, I'm releasing tears that I've been holding back, that I've been suppressing. God, I want you to heal areas in my heart that go all the way back to childhood. If you're here in the room and you're not saved, come and join us at the altar. Come and find a spot at the altar. God loves you. He's for you. He's not against you. He's he's with you. His mercy is greater than his wrath. He's got great grace for you today. And let's just worship him all over this room. Let's just take a few minutes just from the back row to the front row just to worship him.
know. that plank on your own and the speck too if you've been hurt by someone if you've been disappointed by someone if you've been let down by someone if you go Paul I think God has appointed me to remove the speck out of their eye the only way you're going to do it is by spiritually going God I lay that brother before you right now I lay that sister before you right now God, you know I need your mercy every day. This thing that's messed with my family, God, this thing that's messed with me, I bring it to the cross. God, I thank you, Lord, that you paid the price, not for me to live with this, but to be free from this. So I'm leaving it there. I'm leaving the worry, the anxiety, the depression, the fear, the hurts, the wounds, the bitter. I'm leaving it at the cross. God, I want to have eyes to see. So I got to get the plank out. And I got to carry it to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. God, I pray right now that the kingdom of heaven would just invade our hearts and lives today. That more of your mercy and compassion. I pray for the person in the room that that needs to forgive themselves that needs to to know that the tears are not a bad thing, that the the hard season of tears is actually your greatest season yet. God says, this is it. This is, I'm doing my greatest work while you're mourning right now. I'm producing in you a harvest of joy. Those who plant and sow in tears will reap a harvest of joy. Let's just pray this together. Say, Jesus, I surrender. I repent. And I receive your forgiveness. I believe you died on the cross for my sin. You rose from the grave. I confess you as my Lord, my Savior, my great physician. God, I need you every single day. Holy Spirit, fill me with more of God's love, his power, his presence every day. In Jesus' name.